Good to see everyone tonight. So thankful that you're here. Appreciate you having chosen to be with us on this Wednesday night. Our summer series continues. We have had some who have been out with illnesses. We're thankful that some are recovering and some are still having some issues and we want to continue to pray for them and keep all of them in our prayers. One additional announcement that we have that uh, has been put on our prayer list most of you remember Keith Parker, who held a meeting here a few years ago now, had a son by the name of Pete. And remember, Pete came to be with us, but Pete has been diagnosed with lymphoma, and they have requested that we remember Pete in our prayers. And so uh, we'll, we'll do that tonight in, in our prayer. And uh, our opening prayer tonight will be led by Brother uh, Ed Griffith. Our singing tonight will be led by Grant Addison. Our speaker tonight is Brother Bill Irby. Brother Bill and I have traveled in the same circle a little bit earlier. Brother Bill preached at Atwood for about four and a half years, and there was a, a preacher or two in between us, but uh, he did come back and hold several gospel meetings while I was there. And he had since moved to West Hobbs Street in Athens and preached there for 31 years before retiring and getting really busy, I think, now doing uh, fill-in work and other things. But we are so appreciative of his work, his good work, and his uh, good example that he has set. He's married. His wife's name is Ginger. They have two sons, Will and Tom. How many grandkids? One grandchild. And so... Get the important one in there, you know, get the grandchild in there, make sure we do that. Brother Bill will be speaking tonight. His topic in our series on peace has to do with my peace I give to you. And so we look forward to hearing him and uh, listening to the things that he has to say. Are there any other announcements that we need to make? Anyone else that we need to add to our sick list? If not, we'll begin with a prayer. Brother Ed will lead us in that prayer. And then following that, Brother Grant and then Brother Bill will be doing our devotional and invitation before our young people are dismissed. Heavenly Father, as we approach the throne tonight, we give thanks. We're thankful and honored that we can be here. Help us to put our minds and our thoughts in your direction. Let us put aside the things that we've gone through today, the things that we've done, and help us to totally concentrate on your word. We're thankful for the opportunity we've had to be a part of the series that's being taught on peace. Because so many in the world don't, do not know, nor do they have peace as we have it here, as we here in this building have that we can speak freely to each other. We can be a part of the happiness that we can have to get together and share each other. The fellowship, the meals we have, all of those times that we have to get together. And we can do it in a peaceful atmosphere. How we do this, we ask ourselves. We realize, Heavenly Father, if we study and meditate upon your word, that we learn that because you love us, because you sent your Son into this world, and because you shed your Son's precious blood, that he gave it freely for us so that we can have forgiveness of our sins, so that we can be free of these sins, that we can enjoy this peace that we, that we pick out in your word and help us to always be mindful of the act that you brought about through your son. Sometimes we forget just how much you love us. We forget how much we love each other. Sometimes... Uh, we're ill with one another because we let the things of the world, the things of the day, the things of work get to us sometimes to cause us to act in a way that is not acceptable in your sight. 
We pray for those that have been mentioned here tonight. They're sick and afflicted. We especially pray for Pete as he suffers the life sickness that he carries with him now, his diagnosis. And we pray for Ken and the family as they go through this ordeal because it is so hard on the family to accept someone that is young and a part of that family. We pray that you will give them the strength, upbuild them, and if possible, that you return the health back to him that he so needs. We pray for all the others that are in, in fellowship here at this church and the struggles that they're going through, that you will be with each of them. And we pray that they'll turn and read your word for strength and consolation, as well as our fellowship with each one of them. Help us to be mighty in our words, that we tell them we love them, we appreciate them, and we're thinking of them, and our prayers are with them each day. We're thankful for the, this church here and what it means to the community. And we do sometimes fall short in the things that we do to promote it. But we're thankful for the elders, for the deacons, for the members that are here and everyone that's present. For sometimes it's so difficult to work a day's work and do those things out in the world that we do each day and to get ready to come to church. And we're thankful through your word that we study and meditate upon that gives us the strength to overcome them that we always keep in mind in the thought that when the time comes to meet together that we will not have any difficulty or any thought of doing anything else but being here. We're thankful for the one that's gonna to speak to us tonight and may he have a ready recollection of the things he studied, and may they be presented to each of us that we can understand, and we can gain further knowledge of peace so that we can carry it into our life and shed it with others. For this we give thanks in Christ our Savior's name. Amen. As the devotional this evening. Uh, Mark has, of course, informed me about the fact that y'all have been in a series on peace. And uh, I, I really wish I could have heard uh, a number of those lessons. I'm sure they've all been excellent. But just in our few moments together right here, 
I'd like to invite our attention to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, just the first couple of verses there. Paul said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. You know, Paul knew that the people that he was writing to in Rome, the purpose of the letter was to encourage the church there. And he's writing to Christians. And of course he has some challenges for them. But one thing he wants them to understand is what we all need to remember to understand all the time. That we are tremendously blessed as, was, as the man prayed. We are tremendously blessed by the fellowship with Christ that we enjoy. And the fact that that relationship is the, the small end of the very taproot of the faith that provides for us peace. You know, one thing that a child of God, and I'm sure somebody's mentioned this already, but one thing that the child of God can, uh, can do every single night we can, uh, if, if we're a faithful child of God, we can pillow our head. And we may have a lot of things on our hearts and on our minds, people we love that might not be feeling well, and, and uh, family members that we care about that are in some kind of difficulty and trouble. We've all got that, friends. But there's one thing that a child of God can close his or her eyes at night and know that because of what Jesus Christ did for us, we're saved. Our souls are wrapped up in Him. And that peace that is provided for us there is ultimately... When, when everything else is over, that's the only thing that's going to make any difference. I got a note the other day from my um, investment firm. Have y'all got any of those lately? They're not writing nice letters right now. At least mine isn't. And uh, the fellow tells me, he says, don't worry, it'll come back. Got gotcha. you. But, you know, I'm not worried about that because there's nothing I can do about it. But the one thing that uh, is more important to not, not have to worry about is the destiny of our souls. Uh, as we have this little devotional, if you find yourself in a situation where you're concerned about the destiny of your soul, if you're not a, a member of the body of Christ, if you've never been immersed in water for the remission of your sins, you can respond to Jesus' commandment. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You can come and be baptized into Christ. Your sins are washed away. You don't have to worry about them anymore. You have peace. And if you're a Christian that needs the prayers of other Christians, for any sort of thing in your life, you can take advantage of God's grace right now as we stand and sing.
Mark mentioned that he and I traveled in the same circles a number of years ago. And Mark, I don't know if you realize it, but that number keeps multiplying. Long, long time ago. My first full-time local work was at Atwood, Tennessee, at Atwood Church of Christ, and then he came in a number of years later for a really long tenure there and did a wonderful job, and he and I love some of the same people. You know, when you love some of the same people, you end up growing closer together. You just feel there's a bond there that you really can't explain, but nonetheless, we do share that with Ginger and I do with Mark and Marlene, and, and uh, I've got a little picture, a strawberry picture that Marlene made for us one time, and, and I see it every day. I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is, but I see it every day. And so I always think of this great couple. I'm so happy that he's here with you. Now, you know, when you come in to a summer series like I'm doing, here when the thing's been developed and worked on, naturally you're going to be in a situation, at least I'm going to be in a situation, where I probably will say some things that you've already heard. And that's fine because we don't ever get tired of hearing what the Bible says about anything. But uh, specifically, I, I was assigned the, uh, an idea uh, that I thought was very intriguing, and I found it to be a wonderful thing to study up. As a matter of fact, I studied it up, and in, in, uh, that's what I call it, study it up. I studied it up and, and preached it last Sunday up at the East Hill Church of Christ in Pulaski, Tennessee, I, talking about peace. You know, there's a, at the end of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, it was a time for war and a time for peace. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one way. Uh, you know, what, what Solomon was talking about was one element of the definition of the word peace. The absence of war. You know, when you don't have war, you have peace. But really, what is peace? Is peace merely and only the absence of conflict? Is it the absence of whatever difficulty might be present? What is it exactly? Well, I, I came up through the 60s, and I look around, I see maybe some of y'all came up through the 60s. And I remember back then, you know, we had peaceniks. You remember those, some of you? And, uh, you know, the peace sign and all that sort of thing. And you know what, it, and I wasn't a Christian in those days, and what that boiled down to was peace was whatever people felt like it ought to be. And uh, it, it certainly wasn't biblical peace in many situations. You know, make love, not war. That's not biblically peaceful at all. Well, in John chapter 14, this is the assigned passage. John chapter 14, verse 27, the text says here, Peace I leave with you. This is Jesus speaking. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I think we all are familiar with the context of John 14, particularly this passage. Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. And he knows what's in front of him. And he's communicated this in a number of ways to his close, closest disciples, his apostles. Uh, I don't think they got it until much later. They didn't understand what, uh, when he talked about leaving them, uh, they didn't understand fully what they would understand after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them. But he is preparing them. And the material we have in, in John, really it's John 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, all of that is material that I believe they would look back on after they became inspired apostles in Acts chapter 2 and understand fully what he was talking about. Well, what Jesus is talking about is, is the peace of God that would rule in their hearts. But it's not peace in, in terms of what the world defines as peaceful. At least, particularly not in the passage that we're talking about here. So let's go back to uh, John 14 and begin with the verse 25 where it says, These things... Remember, Jesus is talking to his disciples, trying to prepare them for the time that he's going to be away from them. And, you know, that's going to be a terrible shock to all of them. He goes to the cross and dies. As far as they know, he's gone. He's gone. Now, if, if they thought about the things that he talked to them about, 
if they thought more carefully about passages like Daniel 12 and others, they might see that, you know, he was going to come back. But you know that they were upset and agitated. Even Peter, you know, he just didn't know what in the world to do, so he did every bad thing he could think of in terms of responding to the situation. So when Jesus says here in, in John 14, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. So in contextually, it's important to get that in mind. He said, I'm talking to you now because I'm still with you, but now I want you to listen to this, he says to them. But the helper, and this is New King James, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now, you know, you've been in a situation where you've heard some very important things. For, say a doctor calls you and you go into the office. He's telling you everything about the report. that he's, And you walk out and you, what did he say? What did he say? What did he tell us? So Jesus knows that, the, that his men are not getting what he needs for them to get. And he knew that they wouldn't. But he also knew that he had prepared a situation where they would be reminded and guided into all that truth that he had shared with them. He said, uh, he, he said, peace, I live with you. My peace, I give to you. So he says, peace, I live. My peace. See, he's, he's using the pronouns his personal pronouns, indicating the specific type of peace. It's not, it's not simply the matter of absence of war or absence of conflict or a- absence of anxiety. It's a specific peace that came from Jesus. The peace that He provides. He says, you have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Now that, that would be, if I'm sitting there and listening to Jesus, I'd have to say, I don't know. We, I don't know if we're really happy that you're leaving. You know, we've all left our jobs. We've all left whatever it was we were doing. We've been following you, and you say, and we love you. And you say, if we loved you, you'd be happy that I'm leaving and going to the Father. Well, wait a minute now, Jesus. If you leave us and go to the Father, that means we're without you. Then what are we supposed to do? You know, go fix, uh, some of them go fix their nets. I don't know how Matthew's going to get his job back. But anyway, they're going to work it out. They're thinking about these things. He says in verse 29, And now I have told you before it comes. See, this is one of the most beautiful things about studying the subject you're studying, it brings you into contact with how the Bible works. Jesus says, I've told you before it happens. So that when afterwards, when it happens, you'll know that what I told you was the truth. He says, I've told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. So when... when uh, The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus takes place, and then only fully when the Holy Spirit comes upon those 12 men on the day of Pentecost, you know, you can imagine they say, oh, this is what he was talking about. This is the whole picture here. We're beginning to see the whole picture. Now, it took them a while to get the whole picture. You know, Peter didn't understand the Gentile situation until Acts 10, and, and, you know, Paul was certainly in the dark, about a lot of things uh, until later on. But you see, the process is, Jesus said, listen, I've promised you're going to be guided into all truth. And that's in, that's in chapter 15 and 16. You're going to be guided into all truth. So when all of this occurs, I want you to look back and see the source of the peace that you're going to have at that time. Now, I don't believe these fellows had the peace that Jesus is promised, promising them at, at this point in time, before his death, burial, and resurrection. He says, I'm giving it to you, but I don't think they had it, because they certainly didn't act like they had it. Then he goes on to say, he said, I will no longer talk much with you, 
for the ruler of this world is coming. That's, if you go to Ephesians chapter 6, that's the devil's coming, right? The devil's coming. And he has nothing in me. So those don't worry about it. The devil can't handle me. He said, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise and let us go from here. So the clear point here is that the peace that Jesus is promising these fellows is not peace in earthly terms. You know, you ever, you, you sit there and look at the checkbook. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I've looked at my checkbook and uh, somewhere around the 15th, the 16th of the month, and uh, that's about half a month left. And I look and there's not enough right there to get to the end. And so I'm concerned about that. I don't see how it's going to happen. I don't see how it's going to work. That's being in this life. Now you'd say, well, if I'm going to have peace in this life, I need to have plenty of money so I don't worry. Right? Have you all ever known anybody had plenty of money? I've known people who had a lot of money. Just a ton of money. And more money than they could ever spend, and they never did spend all the money they had. But you know what they didn't have? Peace. They didn't have peace. Now, I know that what Jesus is promising these fellows is not peace in human terms because they didn't get it. They didn't get peace in human terms. How many of these fellows live to be an old man that we know about? One. And we're reading his book right now, the book of John. What happened to the rest of them? And just go through it. You know, Paul, when, after he became a Christian and after he got his education, you know, he said that we have to, we have, to have peace in our heart. Uh, he, he counted all the things that he had accomplished that the world would define as giving a person peace, which is, you know, I believe Paul was, uh, I don't think he was wealthy necessarily, but he's certainly well off because he traveled wherever he wanted to go on his own dime. And his uh, parents were in business. They sent him to school at uh, Gamaliel. That's from Tarsus down to, you know, he, he's a man of resources. But that, he counted all of that as dung. He, he, got, he, was, he was successful in Judaism. He counted as dung. He didn't, it was just dirt to him. And what did he count as worth talking about? The suffering that he went through. When you look at the passage like 2 Corinthians 11, when he talks about the things that he went through for Christ, he thought those were the good things. Now you go out here and ask somebody in the world, what, what would be a peaceful life for you? And they're going to say, well, if I, had, if I had all the resources that I needed, and I had my health, and my health was holding up, and not only my health, but more importantly, health of my children and my grandchildren and my, the people I love and care about, if I had all of that, man, then I'd, I'd have peace. I would have peace. But you see, folks, the peace that Jesus is talking about, I know 12, 13 men that ended up with that peace. Of course, Judas didn't. Get him out, put Matthias in, and then you have Paul. And none of them had peace in human terms. They had to work like dogs all their life. And it required a great deal from them. You ever read uh, commentaries? Sometimes they're helpful. Sometimes they're helpful. They, uh, the older I get, <clears throat> I guess I've winnowed down what I like to read in that regard to a fewer and fewer uh, series. But William Barclay has a nice little series. And the reason I say it's nice, it's easy to read. But Barclay's talking about peace in this passage. And uh, he says, in the New Testament sense, the word translated peace is not just the absence of trouble. Listen to this. It is everything that makes for our highest goal to be at peace. And obviously it's peace with God. And Barclay refers to a poet, uh, Robert Burns, which 
a lot of us have, you know, from the, our English heritage, we know a little bit about Burns. Burns talked about religion. Religion is not designed, he said, uh, to be helping people. I thought, wait a minute now. Burns, what are you talking about? Religion? And he was talking about the religion of Christianity. Of course, as he understood it. What do you mean it doesn't help people? He said, no. He said, true religion haunts people. Now, what he meant by that, it seems to me, is that it makes you think seriously about your life. Now, we know what James said, you know, taking care of people, all of that. But the peace that Jesus provided for these people here, for this, these men here, it was something that's so much higher and mightier and more significant and more important and spiritual. It's not carnal. It's not physical. Now, there is practical peace. There are practical elements of peace that come from being a child of God. Now, you know, you talk about those, uh, I, I bet you somebody's preached on this, but uh, one of my favorite passages to talk about the practical side of peace is Philippians chapter 4. Let the peace of God which passeth all understanding uh, guard or keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. See, that's, that's practical peace. What is that? What that is, it, it's based in spiritual peace. The spiritual peace that we enjoy is the peace that says, I, I must be having company because my nose is itching, but the, it, the spiritual peace that we have is the peace that was brought to us by the Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And what, what that's all about is breaking down the enmity between man and God. Now, who, who designed the plan of salvation? God did. Who executed the plan of salvation? Jesus did. Who made sure we knew or know about the plan of salvation? The Holy Spirit did. And all that got started way back in the beginning. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. So the, the real peace that provides us the opportunity to enjoy the practical elements of peace the real peace that's under consideration in the New Testament is the removal of the weight of sin that you and I would otherwise have to carry through our lives. That's what real peace is. It's when we can go to bed at night and know, well, if something happens to me and I go, I'll be with God. That's all there is to it. Unfortunately, Sadly, and sometimes it's just hard to get around for some people. People, even in the church, we equate material happiness or material prosperity with peace. But you know it can't be that way. You know it can't be that way. I have the opportunity, uh, used to have the opportunity all the time, two or three times a year, to go down to a South American country called Guyana. And you know, the Guyanese are thankful for the Haitians because for a long time, the Haitians were the only people that kept the Guyanese from being the poorest people in South America. Of course, that's all over now because the Exxon Corporation has found a big whole puddle of oil sitting right off the shore of Guyana. We go down there and visit those people, and there's a little lady that we'd always go see. She was one of the uh, bedrock members of the congregation out at Bartica. So you had to, we had to walk a long way to get out there. I mean, she walked it all the time. didn't even bother her a bit in this world. She had a little bitty lady, a little bitty uh, Indian lady, and her husband. They were just, they were just rocks. They were just rocks spiritually. I remember one time, well, I remember the first time I met them. We came in there, we were doing a campaign to reestablish the church in that community. 
And uh, somebody in our group had said to this couple, uh, now that we've got the church reestablished, you all need to make sure that you don't let it go away again. And they looked at us and they both told us, we never let it go away. Y'all went away. That's the kind of people they were. Well, walk over to their house up and down the hills, go through the valleys and everything, and finally get to where they live, which was quite beautiful. But you and I would find it to be so rustic that we couldn't be comfortable there. But they were at peace with God. They knew that their salvation was secure because of what Jesus Christ had done. And there was nothing in terms of material definition of peacefulness that they relied upon. Matter of fact, from time to time, there was a lot of uproar in their lives. People not behaving themselves. People in the government acting badly and all those sorts of things. See, you and I are blessed with the opportunity, if we'll grab a hold of it, to understand that our peace with God, and as the man prayed, our peace with each other, has nothing in this world to do with our material circumstances. Now, do we enjoy having good material circumstances? I do. When I walked into this building tonight, man... I heard one lady talk about it. it was kind of cool. To me, it was just right. You know, you never can get it too cold for a fat guy. But I love air conditioning. I really do. And I love having an automobile, and I love having good food and all of those things. But my peace is not tied to those things. It's yours. It can't be. You see, the thing that Jesus is promising his disciples here, they're going to go through a very strenuous period of time but in the final analysis, when they finally come to understand, as he said, I'm going to tell it to you now, you'll hear it later enough to believe it, to fully believe it. When you believe it, you'll be able to carry on the work that I've given you because you'll know what I'm talking about. You might not know now what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that you know that your soul is secured. You know, Mark and I have got something else in common. We, we spent most of our careers, just about every, all of it, doing what's called local work. Local work. Now, he's, he's done a lot of work with PTP, but most of the time he's been with a congregation, this one, uh, Atwood. When you do that, and that's, to me it's the greatest blessing, being a local preacher. When you do that, you get to know people you go to places like hospitals and funeral homes and you stand beside beds where people aren't going to get out of that bed. And then you think about your job. Why, why do we want to be, why do we preach? Why do you pay support preaching work around the world? It's so folks can understand, can come to understand that it does not make a bit of difference at all. In the final analysis, what happens to you? The only thing that matters is that you've got the blood of Christ that keeps on washing your sins away. That's where that peace comes from. That's when Jesus says, I'm giving you my peace, that's his peace. Now, are there practical elements of that peace that flow out of that? Absolutely. I'm not diminishing all of that. The peace that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And that, that's day-to-day -day stuff. That's practical stuff. If you just read Philippians 4, that's what that is. But... Where does it begin? Where does it come from? It comes... You know what? We are in the same shape that the apostles were in after Pentecost. You're going to say, wait a minute now, Bill. You better clear that up. 
You know, if you, uh, remember down, you remember down Front Street in Milan? If somebody would say something like that, somebody in the back would say, all right, preacher. You know, they want you to straighten, it, straighten that up. That's what they'd holler, straighten that up. What I, what I mean to say is, these fellows didn't know the full meaning of, of Jesus' my peace until they experienced Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came upon them and guided them in all truth, just like Jesus said that He would in verse 13 of chapter 16. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak of His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. See, the Holy Spirit at at Pentecost and thereafter guided these men into the truth that, that informed them as to what Jesus' peace really is. He said, well, Bill, how, come, how do we have that? We have the record of the revelation of the mind of Christ. Everything that he wanted those men to know to preach to the rest of the world is in this book. Well, the New Covenant, of course, is in this book, but the whole thing is in the Bible. See, we're in, we, we are in shape to be able to face the future with Jesus' peace. And how, how come we can do that? Because He's given us what we need to know to be able to do that. And what He's telling us is, we, we very simply, we just have to live the best life in terms of His will that we can. And we know we're not going to be perfect in doing that, right? We're going to have faults. We're going to have sins. And according to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-10, through 10, He provides for us a way to have forgiveness of those sins. The blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing us as we repent of our sin. That's available to us. The blood we spiritually contact in the watery grave of baptism, that blood keeps on cleansing us. And we know that. It's not something we think might be the case. We know it because that's what the book says, and the book is the revelation of the mind of Christ. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 He's breathed it out. There's no, it's, there's no uh, accident that the concept of the Holy Spirit being breath is tied to inspiration because, no, we don't have, I'm not inspired of the Holy Spirit like the apostles were, certainly not like Jesus or anybody that ha- the apostles laid their hands on. Mark's not either. There's not a man on this earth that enjoys the miraculous gift of inspiration that people in the first century did. Not one single fellow. That's why when they say that they do, they don't. How do I know that? Because in order to have that gift, you had to have apostles lay their hands on you or had to be there on Pentecost. And nobody was there on Pentecost that's alive now. And you can't find an apostle for him to lay his hands on you. However... We've got this Word. And this Word provides that peace. But it's got to be right. Just got a couple minutes here. Listen. Jeremiah, talking about a preacher had a bad day or two, was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was tasked with telling a bunch of boneheaded Judeans that they needed to straighten up and fly right. And this was before they were carried off into Babylonian captivity. And you know, they never did believe Jeremiah. Now, ultimately, they believed his message because they were carried off into Babylonian captivity. And when they got up there, Ezekiel was telling them the same thing, and they ignored Ezekiel. They made fun of Ezekiel. Oh, we're going home any day now. Everything's going to be fine. 
Tico says, no, it's not. No, it's not. Won't be fine. Won't be fine. Well, Jeremiah, I think it's in Jeremiah chapter 7. Anyway, Jeremiah was, make, was told them that they were listening to the wrong people. Because uh, the people that the folks were listening to and being misled about the fact that we're going to go back home quickly, everything's going to be wonderful, no problem, ignore Jeremiah. They had a peace, peace. They went around, it's peace, 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 peace. What did Jeremiah say about that? There is no peace. Not in that message. You can say the word peace all you want to. But unless you're operating based on the peace that Jesus here refers to as His peace, which very simply is His peace comes to those who have taken advantage of the sacrifice that He made on the cross through obeying the gospel. People say, now Bill, you, just, you can't go around preaching that because see, that's so dry and dusty. Everybody's going to say, well, in other words, you're, you're saying that unless you are baptized into Christ, you're not going to have the peace of God. And I'm going to say, that's correct. It's not available. You cannot ignore the man who died and his instructions about obtaining peace and then expect to have the peace if you won't do what the man said. It's that simple. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Another example. The people listening to Jesus in John 14, which ones of them ended up with that peace? The ones that obeyed him. What the other fella? What happened to him? Whew. Bad deal. Bad deal. You know it's bad when you enter into a crooked deal with somebody and you get caught in it and then nobody wants to help you get out of the crooked deal, including the crooked dealers that helped you get into it. He took the money back to them. What did they do with the money? They took it out and bought a field. This contributed it to a place where he buried people who were too poor to bury themselves. Potter's field. Clay dug out of it. You couldn't grow anything in it. And it's evident that uh, what Judas did was just hung himself out there because he's miserable. Nobody going to take him down? That's a perfect example of a man who gave up peace. Why? Because he wanted to do what he wanted to do as opposed to what Jesus told him to do. And you know, a lot of people look at this. And this you see, where I'm, see why I quoted uh, Mr. Burns? Where he says, that religion, real religion, ought to haunt people. Now, it, haunt, it haunts me, but I, I get past that because I know that we do what God says. We don't, we're not haunted. But you cannot promise, and see, this is what I see in the religious world today, and you do too. You see people that are promising folks spiritual peace without telling them what the author of that peace, though he were a son, yet learned to obedience by the things which he suffered, and be, uh, being the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. I mean, I'm, I'm sure tonight I can listen to the religious radio all the way home if I wanted to, and I could hear people be promised peace without a word of the gospel being preached. See, my peace, Jesus says, my peace. His peace. Yes, peace is the fruit of the Spirit. There's some practical benefits of this peace. He says, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God. 
which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What is peace that passes understanding? Well, if I can't understand it, can I have it? Well, sure you can. What this peace is, it's Jesus' peace, it's my peace, it has practical benefits, but the reason you can't understand it is that you and I cannot come up with it on our own. It's not a peace that can arise from the human intellect. It, the peace that Jesus promised those fellows, the peace that we have as Christians today, that peace has its source in not understanding what God is doing, but believing what God is doing. Doesn't mean that it's fantasy. Doesn't mean that it's, it's what God expects of us, but what He provides for us is worth far beyond measure, more than anything else. You know, y'all have listened so well and appreciate it so very much. Uh, I don't know about you, but I get upset at the way the world's going. Y'all get upset about it. What a mess, right? What an absolute mess everything is in. How can we live with that? You know. Because it's not going to make any difference in the long run. Uh, one more little illustration. My friend Mark Posey, you know Mark. Uh, <laughs> he is, I love him. He is bullheaded. He is a bullheaded fellow. And Mark, if you happen to hear this, yes, you're bullheaded. His wife, his elders, everybody else tells him, now you may not think about coming on out of Ukraine. You know, oh no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. He gets himself, <laughs> he gets himself in a, in a world of hurt. I mean, physical hurt too, over there. But you know, you think about what those people are going through, and what keeps them going. What keeps them going? It's this peace. Jesus said, "My peace." I was watching a news deal the other day it was been a while and they showed the train station at Slavyansk, Ukraine being blown up and there's some Christians in there that died. I was I was in I wasn't in that particular building, but I was in the building that served as a train station before that one was built. That was an older one replacement, I thought. It just hurt your heart to realize that children of God are suffering in that fashion. But they didn't suffer long because they had peace with God. And every faithful child of God ends up with God. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we're so very thankful for your care for us. We're thankful for this good gathering this evening. We're thankful, Father, for thy word. We're thankful that Jesus promised those men his peace and that we can have his peace. Help us, Lord, as we, as we think about these things, and help us to realize that, uh, that we do the best we can with this old life, and we'll have our aches and pains, and we'll have our sadnesses, and we'll have our disappointments, and we'll have our challenges, and we'll have our struggles with sin. We'll have all of those things. But when the final bell tolls we have peace with you through the blood of your son and for that we're eternally thankful in jesus name amen <laughs>